So we're here in Sheffield today with the e-learning team to meet with Catherine Elliott, who is part of the CAS Include group, who've been doing some amazing work to push forward to promote the inclusion agenda when it comes to computing and make sure that computing is something which all pupils, all students in a school can fully participate in and access. Um, we're going to talk today about special educational needs and computing and again what we can do to make sure that no child is excluded from what we're trying to do with the computing curriculum because of particular educational needs or disabilities. So Catherine, thank you ever so much for having us here this afternoon. What do you think teachers can best do to help pupils who've got special educational needs or disabilities to develop computational thinking? Well, I think the, you know, the same way really is with a lot of mainstream students, with a lot of some of the fantastic materials that are out there for unplugged activities and I think the, the, the main thing for students with special educational needs and that in itself is a problematic definition because mm. it's such a broad spectrum of needs but really just making sure that teachers are scaffolding the particular needs that the pupils have so for example if, if we're doing some work on um, algorithmic thinking you know there's, there's plenty of symbols and um, images we can use to make sure students are really clear on, on the kinds of things that, uh, that they're working on. If you have um, devices, recordable buttons, where we can um, create resources you know, for students with a range of needs. So I think it's just adapting and, and thinking about the resources that are out there, um, but that are incredibly useful for, for students with special needs. Um, to really support their learning in other areas. So, for example, in terms of life skills, it's incredibly important for, for some students with more complex, severe needs that they you know, know about making a cup of tea or washing their hands. And you know, we, can, we can bring in sequencing algorithmic thinking into that. Because I think the most important thing is there, there is a danger of saying we have to teach computing and sort of inflicting that on, on, on children who perhaps you know, it, there is spatial value to them. Um, obviously, we're talking about pupils working um, at, at sort of, you know, levels well below national <coughs> curriculum level. And um, I think it's important that for those type of, of, of individuals, that we think about the priorities for them. And those priorities might be communication, they might be physical movement, motor skills, they might be social interaction, numeracy, literacy, etc. And I think you can do some wonderful activities, for example, a simple sort of bubble sort with money, you know, give pupils some different amounts of money and they have to sort themselves from lowest to highest value. Which is still algorithmic thinking, Absolutely. even if it's not necessarily something that will be implemented as Python. Code. But you're also hitting life skills, you're talking mm. communication, you're talking numeracy. And I think, um, I think that's the main message I have is that do computational thinking because it's incredibly valuable. Those problem solving skills are still valuable mm. to all students, but make them relevant and, uh, you know, useful. So what about programming? Does programming present particular challenges to pupils with special educational needs? What sort of thing would work well? Absolutely. I mean, I think most students can access some of the very basic programming, you know, B-Bots or okay. Romas, yeah. and they are creating programs even if they're incredibly simple, although actually one of the biggest problems with many um, students working at that level is knowing their rights and their lefts and, mm -hmm. you know, um, and relative movement to where the B-Bot is. So it's still not simple. But there are ways in, you know, even at that level. Um, I think where it gets more difficult is, obviously, with, with more complex programming languages, even with Scratch. I mean, essentially, Scratch is, you know, it is quite wordy. You have to be able to read to be able to program and write, I and write. But there are ways of, of scaffolding that as well and supporting it. So oh. um, any teachers working in sort of special schools and with students with special educational needs will know the widget symbols and the communication print. And so, you know, it's quite easy to put these on the back or just some very simple sort of images to, to help with that. And what I would say is, you know, if you look at Scratch, which is a wonderful tool for, for programming, it's, it is very accessible in that it's more visual, you can create some wonderful things with it. But just to, you know, give a, a pupil a, a more selected number of commands to begin with and perhaps to sort of plan out um, you know I've got a little scratch planning sheet here where they can actually plan out what a program might mm. do beforehand 
with a, a very limited set because I think otherwise it's quite overwhelming the amount of, of, of commands and things. So there are ways of making it more accessible. One thing I've seen done with very young children is teachers creating their own blocks and scratch mm. to of a very reduced set of the language. Would that work with yes. special education needs children? Absolutely. Well? I mean, yeah. I found out, um, that the, the make your own blocks one is quite a nice one. So I've uh, done one with the drawing blocks. Um. And essentially you have blocks for move up, down, right and left, mm. which takes away the whole knowledge of X and Y coordinates. Yes. Um, a clear block and but also added in some of the symbols. How as well. did you get the symbols in there? Simply by cutting and pasting from um, from Word or from uh, some of the other things. That's very some nice. Some of them don't work very well, so the pen one is a little ambiguous. But I think it gives just that little bit of support mm. to people. Mm. And it means that they, they're still doing the computational thinking of, I have to put this in the correct sequence, I have to understand what it does. Oh. But you're removing the complexity of knowing that move forward is actually changing the x-coordinates and that clearing and resetting is going back to a certain position on the screen. So I think that's quite a nice way of, of mm. doing it for people to make that. So more. scaffolding that yeah. move from a thought of how to solve the problem to now yeah. implementing that as code. Coming back to the, the widget cards there, so the young person programs using the, the widget icons and then flips the card over and looks at that and scratch. How does it work in practice? Um, in practice, really, it's, it's just a sort of a guide to understanding what it is. So I think okay. it's just... It's just supporting knowing what that actually means, right? In order the yes. reading of it. Yes. So, because I think to program just using the widget symbols is yeah. quite complex as well, okay. and it does need a certain level of understanding to be able to do this. But for poor readers, it just means they've got a bit of help with some of the trickier mm. words. Mm. So, for sprite, you might have, you know the picture of a character, um, but it means that they can plan out a program away from the computer, away from the distractions of you know, shiny things, with a limited set and then go and do it on the computer. Hmm. Now obviously special education needs covers a whole range of particular difficulties or needs that a child might experience in school but the Key Stage 3 curriculum has a requirement for programming in a text-based language. Is that a step too far for many of these young people? For, for some it is and I think as, as in Scratch you know I'd, I'd start off with maybe partially built programs that they can tinker with and add to and see what happens if you change a number here and there. And again, with something like Python, actually to provide part of a program that works and um, ask pupils to you know, extend on that or to change parts of it is, is much easier because otherwise I think with some text-based languages it becomes a, an exercise in can I type in these words and not actually in the program side mm. of it. So if you can take away that barrier and you know, Python is, is perhaps slightly challenging in that you know, you've got to get your indentation co correct and um, yeah, make sure you know, you've got all the, all the syntax absolutely correct. Um, one program I do quite like, I think, for special needs students is Sonic Pi. Which oh, yes. Obviously, yes. you can have on the Raspberry Pi, but it's also available for Windows and, and for Mac OS. And that's lovely because you've got a very immediate output. And I think that immediacy is quite important for many students who struggle mm. because they need to see that what they're doing is creating something. And Sonic Pi is um, it's very achievable. The syntax is, is much simpler. I believe it's Ruby, isn't it? Based on, yes, it is. Based on Ruby. Much. And it's, you know, Play 60 is something which I think, you know, pupils can, can grasp that and they can play a very simple mm. tune quickly. So starting off with something like that as a text-based language is, is it, I think those little steps of being able to achieve something are very important. And perhaps for a visually impaired child, much easier to type text into yeah. Sonic Pi than to move blocks around a screen inside Scratch and the immediate audio feedback from the program yeah. running. That's it, and, and um, Sonic Pi does have a, I think it's called the dark mode, where you can switch yes. it into high contrast yeah. and white on black. Um, and again, with, with Python, so many teachers might not realise that in, in if you're using Idle with Python, you can make that more accessible. In the options, you can configure Idle to change the font size, the font, and some of the colours, so you can change the keyword, so you know print will come up, and it already is a, a different colour, yes. but it's not as sharply contrasted, I think. And you can actually make it very, very clear to a student if they're debugging that they've spelled print wrong on, them, you know, mm. on a line compared to somewhere else because it's not bright pink or whatever else. Um, 
So that does make it more accessible. Interesting, there's been a conversation online recently about visually impaired and particularly blind mm. students and how we support those. And I hope that uh, Sonic Pi would be an answer to that, but apparently some screen readers don't deal with it very well. Oh. Um, but I know, you know some blind programmes do use Python and that, yeah. that seems to work fine and um, Java and all sorts of different languages do work with screen readers. So it is possible to programme. Um, even if you can't see that yeah. you're mm. Visual impairment is no impediment to getting a, a job as a programmer or yeah. as a software engineer. Yeah. So what are the success stories? Do we have examples of folk with special educational needs, with disabilities, who've gone on to become computer scientists and software engineers? Absolutely. You know, that there are actually a rather large number and, you know, some sort of key members of CAS, for example, who have dyslexia and um, coping very well with programming and computational thinking. And um, studies have, have shown that actually with dyslexia, um, program languages are quite comforting because they're a very limited set of words. Okay. And, you know, they might spell the names of their variables wrong, but that's fine as long as they're always spelling them wrong. But the key words actually, you know, there's plenty of support in environments. Equally, you know, there are a number of companies now, HP and um, Microsoft, who are actively recruiting students who are on the autistic spectrum. Gosh. Um, and, and for, you know, many students on the autistic spectrum, it's a generalisation, but, you know, they, they, they understand sort of program languages very well and it's a very ordered environment and therefore it makes quite a lot of sense to them. That this isn't for all students with, you know, these... That this is a deterministic, logically predictable yeah. machine that will respond Absolutely. always the same way if it's given the same. Yeah. So you know, and, and again, blind, you know, there are blind programs yeah. out there who are earning a, a good living out of these yeah. things. So you know, it, it shouldn't be a, a barrier having a special need or dis mm. disability, but it's helping make it as, as accessible as possible. And I do think there's an opportunity as well, you know, for any classes who have a member of the class who has a particular. Um, disability, perhaps to think about how we all make our programs and technology yes. more accessible. Yes. So, using Makey Makers, for example, to create um, accessible input devices is a lovely project to do. And also, you know, designing websites, making sure you're putting the alt text on on images. So, I think it's it's quite interesting to have that conversation about. Mm how we make technology accessible and, and why we should be doing that. And what about game-based learning or, or learning through game design? I think there are strong parallels between playing a computer game and learning to program. But is this something which makes sense for, for students with special educational needs or disabilities too? Absolutely. I, I think sometimes what you need with, with certain students is, is a hook and a way in and actually you know, making the most of, of what they're interested in because it's very hard to teach um, you know, program to someone who's really not interested in it. And Minecraft is absolutely enormous with, with a certain section of our student population and I think that um, being able to use that on the Raspberry Pi and program it in Python yes. and make modifications yes. and you know, create lava all over the place and TNT blocks and you know I think that's that's really powerful and mm. it helps and um, obviously if pupils are, are not working at that kind of level there are things like Kodu which I like because it's got the 3D gaming environment look to it and actually for some students they might just be creating a, a 3D world um, but when you get to the programming side of it then what's quite nice about this one is that you have the, um, the block based programming again with Images and icons to help. And no text on coding, or very, very little, little text on yeah. coding. Yeah. So making it much more accessible for children who struggle with that. That's it. Yeah. 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 So these are really useful tools to have. And what about some of these programming games? Things like Lightbot and Cargobot. Do they have a place in the curriculum? I think so, and I think there's a danger that, that you know you just give people a sort of an app to play, and that's mm. that's programming. You know, there has to be the learning around it. But they're they're really engaging and. They, they teach the concepts really nicely without the text-based things, so the loops or the um, sort of selection, things like Codable, which is a very, very simple mm. one. The Bbot app, which is really nice. And there's things like Alex, which is exactly the same commands as the Bbot, so for a pupil working at that level, but it's a, you know, a 
a robot and yes. it's so much more engaging for students who are older. Yes, quite. Much because of the problem is yes, you know, you wouldn't want to use, necessarily want to use the Bbot app That's with right. an 11-year-old, even if the programming is at the right level. So, yeah, there's, there's plenty of options out there, there in terms of those. Do you think, then, that there are some students who will never be able to learn how to programme? Absolutely, there are. And I think, you know, the, these students will be the type of students who are typically in a special school and they'll be learning, you know, very worthwhile things about using technology um, and keeping safe online, using technology perhaps in the workplace, being able to do very simple data entry mm. type of tasks. Um, but even, you know, there are pupils who, who will never learn to write their name or to read a sentence and, and there's, there's no point worrying about teaching them programming. They need to learn more concrete skills, of, um, life skills and things like that. Do you think then for some children with special educational needs or learning difficulties that it would be better to focus on sort of core IT skills and digital literacy, safety, rather than computer science and programming? I think so. I mean, but I think any any student who is independently going online has the capability of doing some computational thinking work right. and some sort of simple yes. programming. Yes. So it's yeah, it, the, the least able of, of our students. Then really, technology. It's about using technology to help them access learning mm. and to access communication. And it should be much more wider, you know, and, and about life skills, as we said earlier. And I think it's it, the main accessible part of it is algorithmic thinking, so sequencing, um, sorting objects, looking for patterns in objects, um, some decomposition of problems, because actually, mm. you know, if, if you have sort of um, learning difficulties, then being able to look at a complex problem and break that down is a really useful skill to have across the curriculum. There are certain things like abstraction which become a bit more difficult and uh, sort of ignoring the detail is, is quite difficult for some students with special needs, but equally they're, they're all incredibly important skills to have which I think are, are applicable everywhere. So whether or not you're summarising a story or you're evaluating a piece of work, then then these are, you know, the computational thinking skills that, that feed into everything. Um, but certainly sort of, yeah, thinking about sequencing and logical thinking and how we might solve a problem is, is what it looks like at that sort of level and a bit of, you know, what happens if I press a button, being able to... Um, Make a prediction and give a reason predict. why exactly. something does what it does, absolutely. Exactly. And I suppose there's also, alongside the concepts of computational thinking, we have the approaches of things like tinkering and, yeah. and working collaboratively. Yes. and being able to make something and being able to fix things when they go wrong and then persevere when things are difficult. And I think we'd all agree that those are wonderful traits to have as, as any young person. And, yes. And they really will help, you know, people with specific needs to, to deal with the world around them and, and, and things that they're coming across in other parts of the curriculum. So, yes, I, I'm, I'm a big advocate of teaching all of those things. And that's something which the revised P-scales capture, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, so things like, you know, if something doesn't work the first time, then trying a different approach mm. would, you know, put that in there. So hopefully it, it does reflect a bit better what, what's happening further up uh, the curriculum. So Catherine, you've led some great work on revising the P-scales, which were developed for the old ICT curriculum, and bringing them into line with the new expectations for computing. Can you tell us a little about what you've done there? Yes, so myself and uh, some, some other teachers and advisors around the country got together because we were all sort of individually doing work on, on the P-scales because we could see that um, they hadn't changed with the change of curriculum and were no longer sort of really fit for purpose. So we thought rather than reinventing the wheel, we'd, we'd sit together and, and, and complete our own revisions. And so we've made sure that we've included sort of references to e-safety in there where it's relevant, computational thinking, but also sort of digital literacy side of things. Mm. And um, in, a, in a world where, you know, we're assessing now without levels, then we don't want them to be something that, you know, teachers are ticking off with their pen saying, well, this people have done this. But actually, we're hoping they become a bit of a guide for teachers to understand a little bit of what computing might look like at those levels, mm. because it is new for everyone. So as much as anything, it is an assessment tool, but it's also, you know, it's, it's a way of understanding what computing might look like for a student working below national curriculum levels. And they have now found a home on the CAS Include website. Right. So... Um, 
they're in the resources section there and hopefully teachers can, can make use of those. Mm. Catherine Elliott, thank you once again. Thank you. Computing at School is a membership organisation of over 20,000 teachers, educators, academics, IT professionals who all care passionately about making sure that our students have the best possible experience of computer science education in their schools. We're very much a face-to-face -face organization. We have local meetings, we get together and support one another in teaching this exciting subject of computer science. But we're also a community which makes great use of technology. So visit our website at computingatschool.org.uk and subscribe to this, our new CAS TV YouTube channel. On here, we're hosting content which gets to some of the nitty-gritty detail of computer science topics, talking to some of the real experts in these fields. We're also talking about broader educational issues, such as how to run a good computing department, about inclusion in school, and some of the particular pedagogic questions about how to teach computer science most effectively to a new generation of young people. Do subscribe to the channel.